Hello, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the second class of Control Systems 2. Today, we're going to talk about some uh, um, important aspects of designing a control system. In the previous lecture, we focused on we focused on uh, determining, I mean, recapping what are the objectives of a controller. So we are in this business of designing controllers. Why are we doing it? We're doing it to uh, obtain stability, to uh, guarantee performances, and the robustness uh, to a number of, uh, of uh, potential limitations that we have in, for example, the knowledge of our plant, model uncertainties or we want to be able to reject the disturbances that are typically low frequency uh, signals that enter the loop at some point. We showed a loop where uh, these disturbances were coming in after uh, the input, that was the output of the controller block, and to do noise rejection, which is typically a high frequency signal that comes from, um, it's typically uh, induced by a sensor that is used in measuring the output of a system, and, uh, and the measurements are never precise. There's always a noise added on it. Uh, we then looked at some uh, important functions in a typical loop. Uh, we call them, uh, the, well, not we call them, they are sometimes called the, the gang of six, which are different transfer functions that uh, uh, relate in the frequency domain uh, different inputs and uh, variables of the system. For example, um, we considered as inputs to the whole system the reference signal, or which is, uh, let's say, the ideal final objective, is what we would like our output of the controlled plant to follow. We considered as other inputs to the system the disturbances and the noises, as we mentioned before. And we derived these uh, uh, six transfer functions in the case of a uh, two degree of freedom architecture with uh, uh, a feed forward block uh, on top of a feedback one for controlling the system. And uh, we saw in particular that there were a couple that were of uh, interest, the sensitivity function and the um, complementary sensitivity functions because they describe directly the relationship between the noise and disturbances and the, the um, inputs to the system and the output of the system, which are variables of interest. So we saw that in order to obtain good performances with a uh, system, for with a controller, what we wanted is a uh, open loop transfer function, which is just the multiplication and the frequency domain of the controller and the plant transfer functions. And uh, we focus on the transfer function just because it's, it's, it's part of the definition of the sensitivity and the complementary sensitivity. And we saw that if we shape them appropriately over the frequency domain, we could, uh, generally speaking, obtain uh, the, both disturbance rejection and noise attenuation. Um, today, we will lo look instead at what stands in our way, in the sense that, okay, now we know where we are heading to. Uh, we have some tools to be able to quantify and describe uh, how good we're doing and going where we're heading to, but what stands in our way? So what is it that is a constraint to all of this? So we'll see that there are some fundamental limitations and some uh, practical limitations in doing controls. Some of these uh, factors you already saw in control systems one, and we will very briefly recap on them. But some others, like uh, um, the so-called, uh, let's say, the, 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 the so-called principle of conservation of dirt, something we'll look at today, which you have not seen before. And uh, we will look at how, how, how do we actually implement a controller on an actual system. Uh, the, that's why we have a ducky bot here today, just to serve as example of, of an actual real system where um, the controller is, is implemented as a piece of software on a computer. So well, in the process of doing this, uh, things change. Uh, we can't just think of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the system we want to control in the same way we've done until now, that is in continuous time, simply because a computer, as we will see before, does not have a notion of continuous time, so we cannot assume it. Um, so let's start directly with the fundamental limitations. Let's say we decided what our objective is, and we want to. We are given a plant, and we we have to. We, we embark in the mission of designing a controller. Is it always possible to find a controller that actually 
achieves our objectives? The answer is no. Uh, sometimes there are systems that simply cannot be controlled. Uh, controllability can be defined in different ways. You have seen this concept already. Uh, we could uh, think about it as uh, the ability to always find a sequence of inputs that can drive the state of the system from uh, any point it is to, to zero, for example. There are some systems for which this is not possible because of their nature. Um, the Typical way of saying it is you cannot make a sedan become a, Ferra uh, a race car, right? There is simply no way a controller can do that. There are some intrinsic properties of systems. There are many different mathematical tools one can use to assess uh, controllability of a system. You are seeing here one of the most uh, uh, typical ones, which is control checking the rank of the controllability metrics. You've seen this before. So and we'll actually prove this uh, in, in, in few, a few lectures from now when we're going to talk about uh, state feedback and the duality of observability and controllability. So I'll just assume this as a given for now. And um, let's assume the system is not controllable for some reason. Is there anything we can do about it? Uh, typically, no. Uh, the only thing a control engineer can do when trying to assess the way in which a system is controlled is uh, pretty much deciding uh, where to place the actuators and where to place the sensors. The sensors play no role whatsoever in the controllability problem. The, position, the choice of the actuators, actuators, that is the choice of the inputs to the system, should be uh, wise. And wise means uh, it's always best to have the, most poss the biggest possible influence of the inputs to the outputs of the system. So if it is possible to... Uh, change the definition of what our inputs are in the physical plant we're studying and choose inputs that have a great influence on the outputs, that might make the situation better, but it might even not. So controllability is always the first check one, one has to do when designing a controller. Then you recall last, last class uh, we asked uh, ourselves the question how to make a, a brick wall fly, right? And the solution was to just divide it by a brick wall and multiply it by an airplane. And that's the fundamental concept of plant inversion, which uh, shows us what is the ideal situation of controls. Uh, if we had a perfect knowledge of a plant and uh, we could do plant inversion, then we could achieve ideal performances. The output of the system would track the reference at every single point in time and there would, wouldn't be any problem. In practice, though, we've seen that uh, in order to do plant inversion um, that cancels the actual plant and therefore allows us to do the division of brick wall with brick wall, it is uh, most often in practice unfeasible. Um, the main reasons for this are the presence of time delays. So uh, time delays, if we invert the transformation, it means we are basically designing a controller that predicts the future and that's not possible. Uh, it's the, a similar situation when we have uh, um, more poles than zeros in the plant, so the inversion will cause an unrealizable plant, same concept. It is impossible to do such a thing when you have uh, uh, open loop unstable zeros of the system, because in inverting the plant, you would be generating a controller that has uh, an unstable pole or more unstable poles, and that's never a good thing to do. And uh, we looked at uh, uh, what happens basically always, that uh, even if all those situations that we described until now don't happen, still our knowledge of, of, of the actual physics of the plant is always limited. And this is summarized in the nice uh, saying of uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? A model is a mathematical description of something that happens, and it's not the reality. It's not really what's going on. All models are wrong. Um, they are tools we use to describe the things that are most interesting to us. And let's say even that we are trying to describe a system that is particularly simple, we know the first principles, we can write just everything down considering all factors. Still, the parameters that describe the system might change in time, uh, have bounded variations in time, for example, due to the aging after repeated use of the system. So doing plant inversion in that case would not cancel the plant and defeat the whole purpose of doing it. So um, we looked at you looked at time domains, uh, time delays in control systems one. I will not go over uh, go over them again, but I will just recap that the presence of a time delay increases the phase uh, lag of the system. 
that linearly in frequency. And um, I think the relevant thing to remember is that it can be uh, approximated a delay with a um, many different ways to approximate it, but the Padet approximation is, is, is a very good one. It, uh, it um, adds to the system a stable pole and an, a non-minimum phase is zero, a right-hand plane zero, which is basically uh, the equivalent of having delay, at least in first approximation. And uh, a delay does not modify the uh, magnitude of the response of the system. It has unit uh, magnitude frequency response. So you looked at a recipe to, to design a control system in presence of delays. And uh, this is a, literally a copy and paste from the slide of Professor Frezzoli of Control Systems 1. And you can go back and look at the details there. <laughs> One thing that we have not, um, let me jump a slide. So we have seen last class that the sensitivity and complementary sensitivity functions played a significant role in achieving performant, uh, a performant controller because uh, the sensitivity would, uh, uh, function would regulate the relationship between disturbances and noise. So in order to have good disturbance rejection and, uh, and eventually good tracking, we would like to have, um, for example, a low uh, sensitivity function at certain frequencies but higher at others. Well, the complementary sensitivity functions regulated, the, described the relationship between the noise and the um, dynamics of the system. And as well, even that is something bad that we want to atten attenuate. And we saw that it was impossible to do so, uh, to achieve both worlds at every uh, point in frequency because of their complementary relationship. That's why they're called sensitivity and complementary sensitivity. It means that if you sum them up together, you get unity. This implies that if you want to have one of the two functions that is, for example, smaller than one because it wants to, it has a, uh, it represents an attenuation over at a specific frequency, uh, you cannot have the other one as well very low at that same frequency because they're complementary. But on top of this, there is another important constraint in. Uh, um, in designing a controller. And that is that on top of the constraints at a single point in frequencies, there, in frequency, there are constraints over the global distribution of the sensitivity function. In particular, Bode uh, demonstrated this integral here that basically says that uh, when you have a system that has, has an unstable pole and some uh, uh, characteristics at high frequency or rolls down with at least a relative, it has a least relative degree too, has two poles more than zeros. Uh, this, 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 this relationship uh, stands. Now, we're, we're not going to prove this. Don't, don't, don't get scared by the ugly math. But the concept behind it is very powerful. It's really important. And what it says is that if you integrate some function of the, uh, some of the logarithm of the sensitivity function, which is so important for achieving good performances, you get a constant value. Okay? So... Constant value means that uh, it's, if you push somewhere, it gets up somewhere else, okay, as we will see later. And this constant value, since ideally we would like the sensitivity function to be as low as possible all over, over all frequencies, because that would suppress all um, disturbances. But it is proven that this, this quantity that is always constant is uh, bigger the more we have unstable poles. Okay, so unstable poles are a bad thing in general. So this relationship, which is not so often um, presented in the study of control systems, is actually a, a principle of conservation because it says that some quantity, this logarithm of the of, of the magnitude of the frequency of the sensitivity function, is always constant and it's bigger when bad things happen. Okay. So since these are bad things, uh, one uh, uh, famous author called uh, Gunther Stein that gave this, um, this, this famous Bode lecture, which you have a link at in the references of today's lecture, and I warmly recommend you to, to, to watch at home, um, calls it dirt, right? It's something we don't want, so let's just call it dirt. So this is the principle of conservation of dirt, and it's fundamentally the only principle of conservation we have in controls. Like, it's, it's good to have principle of conservation. It gives dignity to the subject, right? 
this one? Yes. I would like to know what happens if k is zero. Then this, uh, if you have no poles, you mean? Then this is equal. Unstable poles. No unstable poles. It means that this is equal to zero. And it's still constant, and the value of dirt is zero. Um, so what this this rep is represented. You can see that basically what that integral represents is the total area between these uh, uh, two uh, parts of the distribution of the sensitivity function uh, over, over the frequency domain. So when there are no unstable poles, what you have is simply that this sum has to be zero. So there has to be an equal region of attenuation as amplification. So it is typically desirable to have low frequency, low sensitivity function response at all frequencies, but it's simply not possible. And uh, many have uh, uh, come to, uh, at least we could, we could say that the whole exercise of control systems is nothing but trying to move the dirt from some position to some other position in the frequency domain. But you can't throw it away. You have to keep it. It's only about where are you going to uh, um, throw it. So this is known as the fact that this quantity has to be constant, and the, you remove, where you remove some, you have to add it somewhere else, is known as the waterbed effect. So because on a waterbed, if you sit somewhere, the other part goes up, right? So this relationship uh, tells us fundamentally one important, two important things. Uh, of course, the conservation of this quantity, but the fact that Generally speaking, unstable poles create difficulties because limit our possibility to get attenuation of disturbances at specific frequencies. What if we have instead uh, right-hand pole zeros? Well, uh, this relationship was later um, extended to, to this more complicated case, and uh, you will see that the difference is fundamentally the presence of a uh, weighting function in the, in the integral that is a function of these unstable zeros. Uh, and, uh, and the quantity on the right-hand side, the dirt, basically goes to infinity when you have an unstable pole that approaches an unstable zero. So when you have infin an infinite dirt, there's no way you're going to be able to design a, a controller that is effective. In fact, the most difficult plants to control in practice, nearly impossible, are the ones that have uh, open loop and stable poles that are very close to right hand plane zeros. And this uh, relationship shows it very well. So it, um, it is important to, to note that the presence of uh, these, so if you look at, I mean, it's not obvious from the, from the, um, just the definitions of these weighting functions, but their meaning is that uh, the presence of zeros, basically of unstable zeros, what it does, it reduces the uh, frequency range at which we can uh, distribute this dirt on. So while in the case of absence of unstable zeros, we could think of, okay, let's take away a finite quantity of dirt from the low frequencies because it's where we care most about the disturbances typically have low frequencies. And then we have an infinite range of frequencies where we can distribute this finite amount of dirt, right? So what's the problem? We just add an infinitesimally high amount of dirt over all frequencies, nothing should really change. And that's pretty much what, what it, it, it's a good strategy, it's a good line of thought. But when you have unstable uh, right-hand plane zeros, then these weighting functions effectively send it to zero the contribution of this uh, sensitivity function over some ranges after the, the zero. So oh, let's fast forward in the future. So the idea is that uh, this we no longer have the opportunity to take a finite amount of dirt and distribute it over infinite frequencies because this range where we can distribute dirt becomes so smaller. So everything is more challenging. So in summary, we uh, looked at, these are some of the fundamental limitations in the sense when you have a system that has these properties, uh, you are going to run in some trouble designing a controller. There are strategies to get over it, 
but it doesn't matter what kind of control you use, if the latest, most modern, uh, fantastic um, um, model predictive control approach, or you call your uh, buddy that is an expert uh, control system engineer, there is really fundamental limitations that apply. On the other side, what happens most of the time is that um, controllers have to be applied on actual systems. So let's say we design a controller. We do all our good thinking and continuous time, and then we want to control something like a ducky bot. Okay? So a ducky bot is nothing too fancy. It's basically a toy scaled car. And uh, it's an actual physical system. It's not like some, some, some weird computer stuff. It's a car. It drives around. It has motor, torques, mass. You know, it, it has regular dynamics. But where is the controller here? OK? So we have some sensors. Um, now, we won't get into detail of the sensing. Because there is a camera. It takes images. From images, somehow, we can think about as if we're measuring our position. OK? But Say we want to apply a PID control or whatever kind of controller you come in mind with. Where, where are we going to put it? Okay, so there's a computer on a ducky bot. As in most, uh, as in a ducky bot, as well as in many other situations, microcontrollers are used to implement a controller. So today we will see a little bit how to, what happens when when we do this 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 process. Even if in the classical control loop that we saw before, we know that um, every, we, we thought of this as everything in, uh, in continuous time, now we can think about the process as something that happens in continuous time. The process in the ducky bot would be the actual driving. Okay, So there is uh, a car, it has a mass, it has a battery, it has all its things, it has two motors, two wheels. The motor somehow will apply a torque to the wheels. The wheels will move as a consequence of this torque. The motion of the wheels will induce a motion of the whole chassis. And that's uh, first principles. That's the physics, right? So it's, it's a continuous plant. It's uh, something that just goes on. But all the, the section that is uh, designed by us actually happens uh, on a computer. And uh, computers simply don't have a concept of continuous time, as we will see. Everything happens in discrete time, we say. And discrete time means that a function is not available at every point in time, but just at some individual points in time, the sampling instance. So typically, when uh, you have to deal with uh, designing a controller that is going to be implemented in a computer, microprocessor, in a discrete time environment, there are two ways to go about this. Either you consider your plant as discrete as well, so you go through a process of discretization, which we will learn about today, and transform your continuous time plant into a discrete one, and then you directly design the controller based on that discrete plant. That would be path A, and it's called the, direct, uh, the discrete time synthesis, so you directly design your controller in discrete time. Or you go for another path that is equivalent, which is so, the so-called emulation path, which means that uh, you design your controller for the continuous plant, because uh, typically that is easier. We have started studying control systems, uh, talking only about continuous time. Everything we've learned is about continuous time. And then we just discretize the controller. Of course, there are some pitfalls. There are some uh, some some. Some, some important concepts that can uh, just break everything, but as long as somebody is aware of them and uh, takes them into account, it is possible to avoid them. We will spend the rest of the lecture today talking about what is the relationship between a continuous time signal and a discrete time signal, and how does this affect the evolution of a dynamic system. Uh, the, fundament the starting point of many of our... Of our, of our um, of much of our work is always a, a differential equation, a linear time invariant system, right? That's, that's a dynamic equation. So uh, it's important to understand what are the consequences of sampling on uh, dynamic equations. And we'll focus mostly on the emulation path, because uh, most of the things we know are related to the design of controllers for continuous time plans. So what's the difference between uh, the loop we saw before and a loop when we implemented on a computer? Uh, basically, these red blocks, okay? 
So this is a slightly simplified version of the loop we saw before. There are no disturbances. There are no, no noises. Uh, this doesn't really matter. What is introduced is a discretization of all the part we design, which is the controller. And this typically is characterized by three big blocks. Remember that a discrete controller can be inserted in a continuous uh, process. Okay? The plant is still continuous time. The ducky bot still is a car driving. It doesn't just appear and disappear at specific points in time. Okay? There is continuity there. So we have to somehow regulate the process between the passage between continuous time signals and discrete time signals, and then make the discrete time signals continuous again so that our microprocessor can interact with the real world. To translate a signal from continuous time to discrete time, we use something called an analog uh, to discrete conversion process, which is usually referred to as a sampler, uh, even if it typically includes three operations of sampling, quantization, and, uh, and then coding, which is somewhat re relevant to us. And on the other side, so the transition between discrete time and continuous time again is typically done through a process called sample and holding. So you receive the sampled value, and somehow you make some, you make some assumptions on how that sample value uh, has to, has to, has to uh, evolve within the sampling period until the next sampled value comes in. So, the sampling part is, um, is relatively straightforward. What happens is that the signal is evaluated at specific time instants, which are called uh, the sampling instance. The distance between, these, uh, between sampling instants, if we consider uniform sampling, we're just assuming that all the samples are equally spaced in time, is called the sampling period. It's a very fundamental term. The inverse of the sampling period is the sampling frequency, which, as we will see, will play a fundamental role in determining what is good sampling and bad sampling for a specific signal. What really happens in the sampling process is that you have a continuous curve that enters the sampler region, but it is only evaluated at specific time instance, okay? And the next time instant is always the previous time instance plus this constant sampling period, the step that we're taking in the, in, in the time domain. So the output of a sampler is a signal, a discrete time signal, that is a collection of points, okay? There's nothing, nothing exists between these points. There is no definition of a signal between these points. The computer doesn't have the slightest idea of what happens between these points. So the only thing we know is that at every specific sampling instant, there are samples of the functions. That is, the evaluation of the continuous time signal at a specific time instant. Once these uh, samples are produced, we are in a hybrid situation where we have a discrete, a, a, sig a continuous time signal, a continuous valued signal, but defined only at discrete points in time. A computer still can't do continuous in any sense, nor in time, nor in values. So even the y-axis is discretized. The process of discretizing the y-axis is called quantization. And uh, that's what you hear typically when you, when you have a sensor, say, ah, oh, this, this camera is whatever it is, it's 8-bit, it's 16 bits. Now, what does it mean? It means that they're using uh, a lot of zeros on one, because that's the only thing computers understand, to discretize the y-axis, the range of possible values that the signal you're sampling might have. Of course, the more bits you have, the more combinations of zeros and ones you can make, the more cells you can make in the y-axis. That means you have a greater resolution, a greater ability to discriminate smaller values. In this example, we're using four bits. It's just uh, uh, eight different regions. So basically, each sample, depending on which uh, position is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is happens to fall, which bin it happens to fall, it gets translated by the coder into a sequence of zeros and ones. So the process of analog to digital conversion, what really is, is get this continuous signal, just evaluate it at specific points, Take these points, average, not average them out, but um, approximate them with the, their quantized value. The higher number of bits you use, the better resolution you have. Of course, the more 
numbers you have to deal with. So you and uh, and the, these uh, these zeros and ones then go to the actual computer that will do something about it. Um, as control engineers, we don't really care what is the uh, what, what the lowest level what happens at the lowest level in a computer in the sense how these zeros and ones are used to do operations. That's typically something that um, there are drivers for and the manufacturer, whatever um, microprocessor, computer it is, will provide you the, the, the weight for the, for the high level, let's say, inputs and outputs of the system. How do they communicate with the lower level electronic components of the actual system? Typically, um, the way we interact with these uh, microcontrollers is through higher level languages. Um, I'm sure you've heard uh, MATLAB or Python or there are many other languages, C, C++, plenty of languages that one can use. Each have their pros and cons, of course, to, to, to interact with the computer, but we'll never go at the level of zeros and ones apart unless you're doing very specific applications for, for embedded controls and stuff like that. So. Okay, now we have this continuous time signal that has been uh, transformed in a sequence of zeros and ones, or let's say in, in a quantized signal. These, this information goes to the actual microprocessor. What is the sequence of oper What does a microprocessor have to do? What does it do with this information? Well, uh, first of all, it has to read this information. And remember, everything exists only at specific instants and times, okay? There's nothing between these instants and times. So, there's no knowledge of what is going on other than when, you evalu when the microprocessor evaluates them. So the interrupt, it's like the, uh, a way to say uh, this is the beginning of a step, okay? And then the next interrupt is the beginning of the next step. You can imagine as if there were an external clock that just told the microprocessor, now it's the time, now it's the time, now it's the time at every constant sampling, after every constant sampling period. Within this time, the controller has to do, the microprocessor has to do a number of things. First, it has to read the inputs. Then it has to use the information to, um, to basically do whatever it's meant to do. In this case, it's uh, to compute the values of a control signal that will eventually be written out. So depending on uh, how fancy our controller is, it could be as simple as calculating two or three numbers, or it could be as complicated as uh, solving some, some, some weird uh, uh, minimization problem. After the values of the controller are computed, now the system knows what, the controller knows what it should do, and, but it has to actually communicate this information to the, to the external world. So it has to write this information to the actuators. And then it has to update its internal status. It has to shift everything to the next time step. Now, these are all key steps that have to be done, but the order in which these are done can, there, there is some wiggle room in which order you do these things. So of course, you need to read uh, the values as uh, um, uh, before you use them to do anything. So if you have a sensor measuring the external world, the values of the sensed measurements have to be read into the uh, controller as, uh, and the microprocessor as the first thing. And then depending on how one decides to uh, organize, especially the gray parts here, so the computation of the control signal and the update of the, of the registry, um, different time is going to be uh, used. So there's going to be uh, a, a, some, uh, some, some delay in the system. Well, it's typically a good idea to send the output to the actual physical plant as soon as possible, of course. It is, even if we haven't seen the actual result yet, I think it is intuitive that the bigger the sampling period, that is, the more spaced apart are the samples, the, you know, the worse it is, right? Because you are somehow losing a lot of data. If you have a, a continuous time signal that is going on and you only pick a sample at time one and then the second sample after 10 seconds, well, everything that happened between one and 10 seconds, the controller doesn't really know. So it's, it's intuitively a good idea to have as, as short sampling period as possible and make the, the, the information available as soon as possible. So basically, there is a trade-off between what is the delay of the system and what is the uncertainty related on this time step. So sometimes it is a good strategy just to artificially delay the, 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 ex, the, the, the operations of the microcontroller and to just make everything happen just that 
at, at fixed time instants, even if these times are, are bigger, which is the situation C represented here. But anyways, the takeaway of this is that um, operations going on on a computer on between different time steps introduce a delay in the system, which should be accounted for when we're doing uh, a, control that is a controller that is implemented on a discrete system. So the signal has been transformed from continuous to discrete. This discrete numbers went into the processor that did some computations. Now these computations have to go back in the real world, have to go and affect the physical plant again. So how do we transform a signal from discrete to continuous? There are many methods. What we are showing here is the simplest one. It's, a call, it's called the zero order hold. And uh, the order is basically uh, um, a term that refers to the uh, derivative that you're considering of the function. So to be clear, say you've got the first the sample that happens at time zero. Um, a zero order holder would just uh, take that value and keep it constant. That is, use the zeroth derivative, which is not a derivative, it's just a constant value, until the next value comes in, until the next sample comes in. When the next sample comes in, you repeat the process. So the computer reads the sample and then just keeps it, the, the digital to analog controller conversion thing, just keeps that sample constant until the next sampling period. When new information comes in, this operation is repeated. So what typically happens is you get this characteristic uh, approximation of a signal that is called the staircase approximation for obvious reasons. One could use more... Uh, more, let's say, the, the, the precise or different higher order holders. Uh, for example, the first order holder would be something that keeps uh, the, the, the first derivative, some, an approximation of the first derivative constant. So you would just propagate forward the, the value instead of keeping it constant. But we're not going to go into that. Zero order hold is, is good enough. What, one thing that is important here is to remember that when we are doing these things, Everything, when we're using a zero order holder, the input is constant between time steps. Nothing really changes between time steps. And that's intuitive because a computer has no knowledge of what's going on between time steps. So it just uses the information that happens at the specific instance. So we are sampling a signal. That is, we're passing from continuous time where there, are, there is infinite pieces of data to a finite set of data that is spaced apart in time somehow. So clearly there are some approximations that are made. But there is a legitimate question to be asked that is, is information lost? So what does it mean information? Well, uh, we can look at this in a different way and ask ourselves the question, uh, say we just have a set of, of samples. We don't really know what the original uh, time domain signal that generated these samples is. Is it possible to reconstruct the actual real Time, time continuous signal just from the samples. If it is possible, we lost no information. If it's not possible, we lost information. So what, how, how does it work? How, where is the boundary between information, uh, losing information or not in the sampling process? The, this result is summarized in arguably the most famous result, uh, one of the most famous results ever at least in our field, which is uh, that of the sampling theorem. Uh, often, it's typically called, uh, this is uh, an important result, it has many names. It's uh, typically called uh, the Shannon theorem. It's uh, sometimes referred to as the Nyquist theorem, and uh, that's wrong. Nyquist never had anything to do with this, with this deal. Uh, we will see that there is a fundamental, the fundamental result is related to the Nyquist frequency, but not because Nyquist wrote the theorem, but because the people who wrote the theorem dedicated that important number to Nyquist because it was a person that had brought major contributions to the field. And um, we will call it the WKS theorem, which is the Witaka Kotelnikov Shannon theorem, because those were the three people that contributed fundamental results in different aspects of this process. So, what does the sampling theorem say? The sampling theorem says, if you have a signal that is band limited, that is, it can't vary infinitely in, uh, fast in time, okay? So its frequency, the magnitude of its frequency response is, um, is, uh, is, is, is limited. It's zero outside some range. Let's call this range the bandwidth of the signal, Fb in hertz. So information will not be lost 
if the sampling frequency, that is the um, frequency at which samples of the signal are taken, is twice, at least twice the Nyquist frequency, which is, sorry, at least twice the bandwidth of the signal. This value, twice the bandwidth of the signal, well, is the famous Nyquist frequency. So you know that in order to sample a signal, you always have to sample faster than the Nyquist frequency. In practice, um, this is like collective experience built in uh, generations of control engineers, you want to bring that number up to five to be safe, okay? Because that's how it ends up working. Of course, if you have very demanding applications where, where, where you really, every, every, every computation you do, every, every detail is important, then you might want to revisit to this rule, this practical rule of thumb. You might make it three, three and a half, but if you want to be safe, five times the sampling, the Nyquist frequency is the um, target sampling frequency you should use. So what does this mean? The bandwidth of a signal represents its frequency content, okay? A frequency content of a signal means it's, it's harmonic components somehow. It's, you can imagine a signal that has, uh, let's put it again, a signal that has only one frequency is a sinusoid at that frequency, correct? So a signal that has a bandwidth, the higher the bandwidth, it means it's composed by sinusoids that have higher frequencies up to the bandwidth. So higher frequencies means higher variation of the signal. The signal can change very fast. Information is embedded in these changes, these small variations, okay? If when you look at radio communications or stuff like this, you usually have a carrier wave, which is something that is a low frequency radio wave that, that, that is used to transport the signal, but the signal itself, it's a small fast variations on top of this carrier wave, okay? So fast variations are good because allow us to say a lot of things in a short amount of time, good, right? So sampling instead is picking a point of information, a point of data once in a while. So of course, if the signal has a big bandwidth, that means it has a potential of varying very fast, it is important to pick numbers as quickly as possible. Otherwise, information is lost. So when a signal is not sampled fast enough, there is this phenomena of aliasing that occurs. Um, basically, uh, it would be nice to go through the proof, but we don't have time for this. So the aliasing phenomena basically means that a high frequency time domain signal, a high frequency continuous time domain signal, is mapped to lower frequency oscillations in discrete time. Okay? So if you look at this evolution, this is an example where, let's say we, have, we decided to sample the signal at 10 hertz. Okay? So if we have a very slow uh, varying sinusoid, so it's a signal that has bandwidth at 0 0.8 hertz, we know the Nyquist frequency of that signal would be 1.6 hertz. We're sampling at 10. We're good. We have plenty of samples, and we can reconstruct the signal from it. The more the frequency increases, the more you can see that the situation doesn't really apply anymore until you get to the, a signal whose fundamental, his bandwidth is 8 hertz. This means the Nyquist rate would be 16. We're not sampling fast enough. In fact, if you connect these points, what you would get is a lower frequency sine wave. So just from the samples, forgetting about what generated those samples, the computer would reconstruct the signal and think it's a sine wave at a lower frequency, okay? It's actually possible to relate exactly what is the relationship between the aliases, that is these lower time domain signals, and the actual uh, sampling rate. We will not go through this because uh, we, will, we have just talked about the descriptive part of the theorem, but not the constructive part, which is the actual reconstruction. So once you have the samples, how do you reconstruct the real signal? That's not of interest to us at this moment. So just to um, take into account this phenomena, what you want to do is just try to remove all the high frequency components from a continuous time signal before it gets a sample. Remember that once you sample a signal, the damage has been done. If you don't sample a, a fast bearing system fast enough, you lost the information, there is no way to recover it. So to make sure information is not lost, typically an engineer designs what is called an anti-aliasing -anti filter, which is fundamentally a device that is a filter. It's, it's, a, it's a, let's say a transfer function meant to send to zero all the high frequency uh, component of the of the sampled signal. 
What is important to know is that in cases of, uh, of anti-aliasing filters, typically these introduce an additional phase lag because it's a filtering process. And uh, so that's more delay, and more delay, as we saw at the beginning of the class, is bad. So I know it's time for the break, but if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. If not, feel free to take a break and see you in 15 minutes. Limit for what? For, let's call it, we just use the same notation as before, h, h that goes to zero of, for example, f of t plus h minus f of t over h, okay? Well, this can be approximated, since we cannot do this part, because there's no such thing as a limit in uh, discrete time. This is the function at the next step. I will guess I'll use the side, mm, where shall I, so this is one third. These are two thirds, so I will draw here. Say that uh, this is our function, okay? So this is f of t, this is time, okay? Say we're picking some value here, okay? This is our time instant t that we represent there. Should have called it t zero. What are we doing? What are we writing? We're writing a forward derivative, okay? So we are at time t. We make a step forward at time t plus h. We take this val the difference of these two values, which is this delta y here. And then we divide it by the delta x, which is that h value there, that h number there. And we make this as small as possible. We get a derivative, right? So in discrete time, that would be approximately equal to f of k t plus t minus f of k t over the step, which in this case is t, okay? So I was about to mention before a point on notations. Um, in the slides, I use a sampling time TS, okay? That's for the first time you see it in your lives. From now on, we'll just call it T. Actually, from now on, I mean, maybe after this, 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 this thing, you'll often find in textbooks that a function evaluated at some sampled instant in time is, they drop off the T. So you'll just write it as F of K. And this uh, represents the Kth piece in time, and the, typically the kth time instant is defined as uh, some initial condition, which is typically zero, uh, plus uh, k, the time step, okay? So when you say k, what you're saying really is the kth time instant that represents this relationship. But we just write k because it's quicker and, 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 and messes things up less. So what's going on here? What's going on is that we approximated the forward difference as a, as a, a finite difference. And now we can use the shift operator that we uh, looked at before. This is uh, QF K of T. So this can be written as Q minus one over T times F of K T. Okay, so if we look at the relationship, the approximate relationship there is between the derivative operator and the shift operator, we could somehow say that P in this case, when we do this a step forward business, is roughly Q minus one over T, okay? Now, typically we don't think about this thing when we do derivatives in continuous time because uh, it actually turns out that the results are equal, so we always present the derivatives in this way. But it's perfectly fair to say, let's not do a step forward, let's do a step backwards. Okay, same thing then this goes to zero. It doesn't really matter if you do it from left and right in continuous time because of continuity. The left and the right limits actually converge to, to, the same, to the same number. So we could just rewrite this as the limit for h that goes to zero of what? Of f of t minus f of t minus h over h, okay? So instead of taking a step forward, we're taking a step backwards, basically. It's called, this is called the forward 
difference. This is called the backwards difference. So this same concept as before, it will be f of kt minus uh, f of kt plus t over t. This is equal, if now we use the shift operator, to what? To, to 1 minus q over t. No, this is minus. So one step forward is q. One step backwards is q inverse. So this can be rewritten as q minus 1 over qt. If you just, q inverse is 1 over q. Just do the calculation and it comes like this. OK, so these are important relationships that we will keep in mind for now. OK, let's go back to the open. So, keep it up. now, how does this, no, 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 I, I'll bring that up in a second. So anyways, how does this now, what does it mean? What are we actually doing with this uh, exit? So you choose who to throw it to, <laughs> and the question as well. Okay. Like a bouquet, you have to turn around and just throw it. Here you go. No, oops. <laughs> this is like the inverse problem of the baseball ball. Like nobody wants to actually get it. <laughs> so um, where do you think we're heading here? Come on, come on. It has to happen. If you just keep on passing it, I will choose. And if I choose, then I have to be mean. And I don't want to be mean for now. So come on. What do you, where, where do you think we're heading here? So we're, we're, we're describing differential operators as, uh, as approximations, right? And we're seeing that there are different uh, approximations. Uh, there's sort of like the solution out on the, on the, on the board, but uh, how do you think this is going to be relevant to the continuation of the, of the class? I guess, I don't know, maybe it's an open-ended question. See, as soon as we start moving the cube around, uh, people actually leave. <laughs> maybe it wasn't that, that much of a good idea. <laughs> so, or share your thoughts about what is going on. Uh, in saying why do you think we're doing these two differences, or if you have any other question, comment, or doubt. Anybody wants to contribute somehow? You that have your hands up? Huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just... Take the cube, please. That's the whole point of the exercise here. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, you just did a little bit recap about limits, right? <laughs> In a sort of different way. I just, yeah. And I'm sitting here a bit a bit, uh, how do you say, bored because, because before we saw that the, we, have a, we have a sampler who takes continuous uh -huh. thing and do, puts it in a discrete signal and I am having trouble seeing the connection between that part before the break and now suddenly we are finding ourselves doing limits. So maybe I think we are headed towards, I mean, I don't know why do we even want to know the limits. Good point. So the reason for which we want to know limits, thank you for your question. I, I appreciate it. So the reason for which we're getting into limits is because limits are the definition of a derivative. A derivative is a limit. It's a limit of something particular. Okay. So in order to understand what's the effect of sampling on differential equations, which are relationships governed by, def by derivatives, we need to understand what is a derivative? What is a limit? Uh, which is a limit? And uh, since computers can't do limits, then uh, they won't be able to do differential equations. And differential equations is so. What, where we're heading today is: Do you have? Do you remember the linear time invariant system description? X dot equals yes, ax plus yes, bu. Yes, I can finally see. So you mean normally a system is modeled with differential equations, right? Yes, and we're going to look at the difference equations representation. Of derivatives in them, and they are from limits, so this is why you introduced this stuff? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
You're welcome. We will see that this passage uh, changes completely all you know about the relationship, for example, of poles to stability of a system. Okay? It will change the expression of the implicit and explicit representations of a linear time invariant system. So it's, it's worth looking at. So, um, where, where are we? So, what, what, what is this, uh, these two? We introduced this uh, forward and backward differences. In, uh, and we want to now understand what does it mean when we are uh, using them to integrate an equation, okay? Because that's eventually what we want to do. We want to end up finding what's the, time, the discrete time equivalent of x dot equals ax plus bu. So if we use, uh, maybe I can, if we use the, Let's say we want to integrate an equation. We have f dot of t, which is equal to s of t. OK? Can I get this up more? Yes. OK. So suppose uh, this is time. This is time. This is, again, our f of t. And this is. Sorry, this is our signal. We, we're trying to integrate some signal. What is going on? And this is our integral, that is the f of t. So we are evaluating this function s of t at some points. Okay? So we saw that when we did the forward difference, what we were actually doing was saying uh, this, we can approximate it as we just saw with the forward differences as f of kt plus t minus f of kt over t equal to s of kt. Okay? So from here, it follows that f of kt plus t is equal to t s of kt plus f of kt. So what does this mean? We have the time value kt, okay? This is kt plus t. It's the next time instant. We take this value here. This is, this is s of kt. And, of course, the distance between these two values is the sampling period t. So what is our, let's say that this ends up to be the integral. How do we evaluate the next point of the integral from, from, from a difference equation. Well, how are we approximating this process? So if we use the forward difference, what we're saying is that the next value in the integral, this is f of kt plus t, is equal to what? Is equal to the previous value, this, plus s of kt multiplied by t. Okay? s of kt multiplied by t, it means this times this, which is the area of this rectangle. Okay? So what we're doing when we're using this approximation of differences, is we are in the process of integrating, we're approximating the curve as a bunch of rectangles like this. Okay? So you will note that in doing this operation, we are somewhat losing some pieces, right? We are underestimating our integral. In fact, say that. Uh, this is what comes out using forward differences. Probably the right value, the ideal continuous right value would be something like this, okay? So we're underestimating our thing. Now, what if we were using the other method, the backward differences? We can do a similar procedure. We just uh, substitute this part here, and it turns out this is for forward. If we look at backwards. Turns out that f of k of t plus t is equal to f of kt plus t s of kt plus t. Okay? So when we're using the other method, what we're doing is we are evaluating the next point in the integral as the previous one, f of kt, plus t time this other value. T is always the base of this rectangle, but now we're using this other value here. This is S of kt 
plus t. So basically, we are approximating, we're considering this area here that overestimates what is actually going on, okay? So if blue is the real ideal solution, white is the backward differences, using the backwards method will give you an approximation that is something like this. It's now I'm exaggerating the differences, but the idea is that you are overestimating your, your, your integral operation. Now, once we see the problem in this way, um, it comes natural to think that why should we take a, a, a small rectangle or a big rectangle? Let's go a little bit fancier, right? And let's just do, for example, a trapezoid, which, I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but it's some way in between, between the two backwards and forward uh, approaches. And that's what goes under name of the uh, Tustin approximation. Has actually many other names, or the trapezoidal approximation, or the Hune's rule, I think it's called, that uh, basically says that f of kt plus t is equal to what? It's equal to f of kt plus one half the area of that trape trapezoid, basically. So it's one half s of kt plus s of kt plus t, okay? And this has to be multiplied by t again. So if we now use the shift operators that we saw before and we uh, find a relationship between uh, the differential operator and the Q shift operator, we will find something like here, okay? So it goes exactly the same process as we followed before, but just using the trapezoid rule, which gives a better approximation of the integral. These are the three different curves that I was drawing before. So now, why is all of this useful? Well, because we talked about continuous time difference, uh, the derivative operator, um, discrete time shift forward the shift operator, it turns out there is a perfect duality in the frequency domain. So the equivalent of the differential operator in continuous time would be the S operator, the Laplace S multiplied by S, a signal in the Laplace domain. What does it mean? You're taking the derivative, right? Apart from an initial condition that we always want to forget about. And uh, the equivalent of the shift operator in the frequency domain for discrete time signals is the so-called Z operator. The Z operator opens a can of worms, the proverbial can of worms. It's the so-called Z transform, which is the equivalent of the Laplace transformation for discrete time signals. We will not treat the Z transform, but we will have supplementary notes for, you, for who of you is interested. We will prove the relationships and, 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 and go into a little bit of detail what, what goes on between Laplace and, and Z transforms. But the core idea here is that thanks to these three different approximations, now we can transform a transfer function from the uh, Laplace domain, from the continuous time, like everything we've done until now, basically, to an equivalent transfer function in the discrete time domain. Please note that all of these methods, so we obtain the relationships for transformation. So basically, you just take your continuous time transfer function and you replace S with uh, one of your choices, basically. Of course, they're all not all the same. We've seen that the Tustin approximation is the more precise one, so it's typically good to go with that. Um, note that all of these depend on the sampling period, okay? So, of course, we saw the influence of the sampling period. The, uh, if the sampling period is too big with respect to the dynamics of the system, the bandwidth of the system, of course, the approximation of the transfer function will suffer will be a bad approximation. So how do you go about doing an emulation? Is, uh, this is a, a summary of what we basically discussed until now. And it's uh, you pretend that you have a continuous time system, you design your controller for the continuous time system, then you uh, check what is the crossover frequency, that means what's the bandwidth of the system, so to speak. You design, you, you, you at, uh, thanks to the sampling theorem, the Nyquist rule, you can pick there then a sampling time. You can use that sampling time to um, generate one of your approximations, emulate the transfer function, check if it's working. If it's not working, you, if the open loop system is, uh, is uh, no longer stable, then uh, that means you have introduced too much 
lag or you have uh, taken a time step that is uh, too big, therefore your computer is reconstructing signals that have nothing to do, aliases of the actual continuous time signal, so you have to increase your sampling time or adjust your controller in such a way that it can uh, compensate for the lags. So, uh, for example, making it less aggressive. So, now that we have uh, uh, understood how we can map continuous time uh, transfer functions to discrete time transfer functions, we can look at how does this affect the, um, the actual linear time invariant uh, systems that we've been so fond of until now. So, I would like to do this derivation. Are there any questions for now, until now? No, okay. Okay, so we're finished with the white shock. Okay. So we know that x dot of t for a linear time invariant system is described by in the state space representation by a x of t plus b u of t. Okay. And the output in time is described by C x of t plus a feed through term d u of t. We're still thinking about single input, single output systems, so this means that uh, the input u of t is uh, a, a scalar. The x uh, and the output is a scalar. And uh, we know we call the order of the system is the basically dimension of the state space. So it's uh, how long the vector x is. It's typically an m by one. We call n the order of the system. The point of what I'm about to do is finding how to now implementing what we've talked about until now and finding the equivalent of this in the discrete time domain. So it will be something x of k plus 1, it will have a similar representation. It will have a similar representation but the matrices are going to be different, okay? So the question is, what are these matrices? How can I, what, if I'm given a transfer function in continuous time, we saw how to translate it in discrete time. What if I'm given a, a state space representation of a system in continuous time? How can we transform that in discrete time? So the question is finding what if there are and what are the relationships between the matrices. So the way to go about this is remembering that the solution of a linear time invariant system like this can be given by x of t is equal to e at the a t x naught. x naught is the initial condition. It is the, the condition at time zero plus the convolution integral from the origin to the current time instant of what? Of e at the a t minus tau b u of tau in the tau. Rings a bell, right? This you all know from Contour Systems 1. We don't need to prove it again. Now, what do we want to do? We want to 
find an equivalent. We want to find a relationship that uh, ties together xk plus 1 and xk. Remember that xk plus 1 is shorthanded for x of xt plus t. And this is a kt, okay, as we said before. So, well, this is a continuous time signal, right? So it's good at every time. Let's just evaluate it at the time instance that we care, the sampled instance. So let's look at x of, uh, x of kt plus t, where t is always the sampling period, okay? Well, how do we get this? We just plug in uh, this every time we read t. So this is equal to a at the kt plus t x naught plus the integral from 0 to t, which is uh, kt plus t of e at the a t, t uh, plus kt minus tau b u of tau in the tau. Good? Are there any mistakes? Who's checking my passages? Who's checking my passages? Okay. So, um, okay, this is something. This is the zero that belongs to this integral here. And this is a t. So, okay, that's one first step. Now let's look at what is the always from here. We first did this passage. Now let's do from the same equation. We do the same thing, but with kt. What happens is we get e at the kt, no need for the parenthesis here, but whatever, plus 0 to kt, e at the a kt minus tau b u of tau in d tau. Now, what is the objective? The objective is getting to a relationship between k plus one, x of k plus 1 and x of k. So we've got x of k plus 1 here, we've got x of k here. How can we relate them? So we can notice that uh, this term here is actually this term here multiplied by e at the at. So we will just multiply both sides of that equality by e at the at. And what we get, we multiply left and right, e at the at, e at the at. I'll just put it in here, e at the at. It's a constant, so it can go in and out of the integral without problems. Now we can, uh, this term is the same as this one, okay? Because the product of exponentials, you can just sum the exponents. So we can solve through this, and it becomes e at the atx minus the integral. And I'll substitute it in there. I'll do all of this in one passage for the, in the interest of time. So x of kt plus t, this, is equal to what? It's equal to this part here, which is this, e at the at x of kt, plus this, my, no, plus this minus this. So plus 0 to kt plus t of e at the at plus kt minus tau b u of tau in d tau minus the integral from 0 to kt of what? Of the e at the a kt minus tau times this. So it's an ugly way of saying kt plus t minus tau b u of tau in d tau. Okay, so you will note that these two integrals are the same, uh, but they're... they're, they're uh, Places in English, the extremes are different. Uh, t is a positive number, it's a sampling period, so we, this is a difference, and it can be easily rewritten as, uh, as uh, e at the a t x of k t plus the integral from k t to k t plus t of what? Of e at the a k t plus t minus tau b u of tau in the tau. Okay? Now, let's compare what we wrote up there and what we have here. x of k t plus t is equal to something times x of k t plus something times u tau. Now, 
let's just recall that since we are now operating in discrete time, between these two time instants, the input value is not changing. It's constant, okay? So this is a constant. It's not actually a function of tau. This is equal to u of kt. That is, we're taking the input and keeping it constant within the sampling period. So this can be brought outside of the integral. So what we get is that we can call, let me get another color. We can call this piece here AD, up there. And we can call this integral here BD, which is the relationship there. I will rewrite BD for clearness. It's, uh, um, we can do some magic. We can say, let's take an auxiliary variable lambda and pose it as x k t plus t. So we do just a variable substitution. k t plus t minus tau. Okay, so the lambda is minus d tau. If we rearrange this integral, what happens is you get the integral from zero to lambda of e at the lambda tau at the lambda uh, in d lambda. Take it, lambda t in d lambda. Um, and we can bring b u of kt out, okay? So u of kt, it's not part of bt, so it's actually just this part here. And... Uh, and this is what we have neatly written. Actually, this is wrong, sorry. It's A lambda, not T. So let's go back to the slides. Now, you will notice that once we understood that the discrete time equivalent of the A and B matrices for linear time invariant systems are evaluations of the matrices and uh, they're a function of the sampling interval as well, then uh, it's uh, uh, easy to derive the C and D uh, equations because they are just uh, the multiplication. It's, it's a direct uh, substitution. So it would be nice now to derive the... Um, once we know that the linear time invariant system can be described as uh, x of k plus 1 equals ad plus, in the, in the way we just represented it, this is the so-called implicit representation of the system. So what is the explicit representation? What is the equivalent of uh, the e at the at for continuous time? All the big expression there. Uh, it turns out that it can be briefly... So once we have uh, x of k plus 1 equals a d x of k plus b d u of k, we can see that x of k, so what is the objective now? Now we want to find what is the direct expression of x of k. Tell me when time is up, please, okay? Uh, so it's... I won't do all the passages because we don't have time, but the key idea is very, is very um, simple, which is just use this equation over and over again. Use it recursively, but just evaluate it at different points in time. So what we want is x of k equals something something, okay? So let's just write x of k. What is x of k? It's this equation where instead of k plus 1, we put k here. So we're stepping back one step for everything. So it's ad x of k minus 1 plus bd u of k minus 1. Just the same thing as before. It's the definition of a, of, a, of a finite different equation. So step one, step back. Okay, but what is x of k minus 1? x of k minus 1 is going to be ad x of k minus 2 plus bd u of k minus 2. And then we have this extra term, b of d u of k minus 1. So this we can rewrite as a squared d x of k minus 2 
plus, uh, just note how I write these things now, which is uh, BD and uh, ADBD times uh, UK minus 1, UK minus 2. I wanted to do another couple of passages, but I don't have the time, so I'll just tell you that if you repeat this k times, so every time now x minus 2, you put a, a, x at the k minus 3, then k minus 4, and you do it for k times, what you get is that x of k is equal to what? Is equal to ad at the power k. You see, if I do it once, it's a square. Every time step, we're just adding another matrix times x is 0 plus this will just grow as b, a, b, a squared b, and so on. By the way, does this ring a bell somehow? Controllability matrix has something to do with that. So this can be un until we get to a, k minus 1, b. And these are, we can do a multiplication, row time column, so it's the sum of the products. We can just represent it as the sum for, let's say, i that goes from 0 to what? To k minus 1 of, of a at the k minus 1 minus i b u of i. And this is the, repre the explicit representation of the discrete time linear time invariant system. And the y output equation can be derived directly by plugging this in in the y of k equals um, cx. Let's just do it. So y of k will be c a k d x naught pu plus the sum i equals 0 to k of what? Of Actually, if we want to be rigorous here, we have to say it's going to be a w of uh, k minus i u of i. And uh, this function w is going to be equal to d to cover the feed-through term when k is equal to 0. And it's going to be equal to the same thing as before, actually with a c in front of it, k minus 1 minus i b for k b equal to 0. I guess this means this is the end of the class. I am sorry for going over one minute. I'll be happy to take questions, though, if you want to ask any. We will finish up the rest of the things we had planned for today at the beginning of next class.